Hi, everyone. Welcome to UCSB. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to share with all of you our work. Um, and today, you know, I will um, let you know what is uh, thermal engineering. And uh, that is my background. We work on, you know, uh, man manipulating heat and for a variety of applications. And uh, I try to convince you, right, they are all very important applications. So uh, as you can see in my title, right, I or I'm a mechanical engineer, and in particular, I uh, work on thermal fluid engineering. So what is that, right? You basically manipulate fluid to carry heat from one location to another, and you can use this to transport energy away from one system to another system. And why is that helpful? Why, why is that useful? Uh, because in many, almost all applications, we have to deal with either heat or temperature. Think about your cell phone getting super hot and laptops getting hot, right? You need to keep them cool, electronics keep cool. Or sometimes when you have a cell phone or batteries and all, al also electric vehicles, right? You ha you're using batteries and you have to keep those batteries in a room temperature window such that you can run the battery safely, right? If the battery is overheat, they can explode. And if the batteries are operating in a very cold temperature, you will not be able to charge or discharge them. So, right, I will share with you what we do in our lab. Basically, we use, we use heat, right? And to look at boiling processes for cooling chips, electronics chips. We also look at how temperature influence battery, lithium ion or lithium metal, metal batteries. When you have hot temperature, cold temperature, when the battery is going through dynamic temperature swings. And one of the projects where we, we work on is looking at batteries in a lo lunar environment on the moon. And we also look at additive manufacturing, right? So this picture on the upper right is a laser scanning through metal powders and the laser will melt the powder, and the when the powder resolidify, that's when you have your printed metal material. And in this process also, heat transfer is really the key, dictating the uh, quality of the printed part. In on, the, on the lower left is we're using light to manipulate droplets and bubbles. You can see that we can use a laser pointer to move droplet to form a UCSV pattern. And this can be really helpful for you know, condensation, desalination, any application involving droplet movement. And but today, right, since I have limited amount of time, I think I will share with you our work on solar thermal desalination. So why do I pick this, right? Why do we work on this topic? And you probably know, right, in being in California, we are a state where you know water scarcity is a big problem. Maybe not except this year, we had a lot of rain, very lucky. Uh, but usually it can get really dry in California. Uh, but on not only that, but if you look at the entire world, right, water scarcity is one of the most serious glo global challenges of our time, especially in countries, you know, de developing countries. You really need, um, you know, scalable, low cost economic uh, ways to, um, you know, provide people fresh water. And however, right, if you think about current desalination technology, right, as for example, reverse osmosis, uh, multi-stage flash, thermal flash, these are terms you may have heard of, right? Um, and so don't worry if you have not. Uh, but if you try to investigate a little bit about our current technology, uh, most of them are very energy intensive. It requires about two to five kilowatt hour energy to produce one cubic meter fresh water. Okay, so, um, and, right, again, in a lot of the, you know, developing countries, we energy also, you know, costs money, right? So we want to be able to provide fresh water uh, with minimal energy input. And so how can you, can you do that passively, right? So the sunlight is actually a free energy, right? You have sunlight, you know, everywhere, and it's clean energy. It doesn't generate any CO2. So there has been a lot of effort trying to look at solar thermal desalination, right? This, how can you utilize sunlight to desalinate? And, you know, if you look at these pictures, 
uh, the, the, the principle how it works is that you can use sunlight to heat a material, right? A material that absorbs sunlight, turn the sunlight to heat, and then use the heat to evaporate salt water to produce water vapor. And then you can then condense the water vapor back to fresh liquid state water. And that's how it works, right? Sounds really simple. You can see there has been a lot of work trying to engineer materials, novel nanostructured materials, to really localize sunlight to the water vapor interface, such that you can maximize utilizing the sunlight energy to evaporate in water. Right? So that has been really nice effort. However, right, if you really think about desalination, evaporation is just step one you really need to condense the water vapor back to liquid water. You, so you need a full system, including both evaporation, turning water to vapor, and condensation, which turns water vapor back to liquid water. And there has also been some examples, right, when I, and I show you here, showing various systems. So basically, the, the idea is similar, right? You use some kind of, uh, like, a, you know, a hydrophilic, you know, a uh, wicking structure to wick liquid from salt water to a material that, that is absorbing sunlight, and then you evaporate, and then you then condense, right? So these technologies, although they show a very high efficiency initially, the really challenging part, the bottleneck of these technologies, is that you will actually have salt crystals that that will form on those membranes. So really salt, right, precipitation in the system is a big problem. And they can appear after only a few hours. Again, the, the reason is because you your input, you're taking salt water from a reservoir, you're evaporating water, right, fresh water, and the salt is left in your system. So that's the big problem. And so um and, and, and again also you know, you have evaporating surface and your condensing surface, these two surfaces need to be really close to each other. Otherwise, vapor needs to transport a long distance to be then condensed, right? So you need to minimize the vapor transport resistance. So these are the two main problems. And so today I want to share with you, you know, you know our approach, right? Uh, hopefully you'll find this interesting. We think that we, ha we have came up with a design that can address the salt precipitation problem. In fact, we think that our device can run continuously, <laughs> um, not just hours, but maybe we can run it for days and weeks and months with no salt. So I'll tell you why that is the case. So first of all, right, we have an inverted system, and meaning that sunlight comes in, we have a reservoir on the top, and then salt water flow into our system. Our system basically uh, include a membrane that is absorbing sunlight. And on top of that membrane, we have salt water. It's a very thin layer of salt water. Right? So evaporation occur on the membrane surface. And the membrane is porous, right? So the water vapor will go through the membrane, go to the bottom side. And then what happens next is that salt is left in the system, right? So they will, basically the salt, will actually diffuse back to the bulk water. And then the bulk water is then discharged. So you have a system, basically it runs water into your system, and then you're removing water vapor, and then the, the higher salinity salt water basically is discharged, right? This whole process runs on gravity, so you don't need to uh, really, you know, uh, use any energy. Of course, the evaporation is driven by sunlight, right? Sunlight heats the water. So that's on the evaporator side. And very interesting, I want to highlight that while we are dumping salt water, we're reusing the heat, right? So if you look at that, we have what we, we're um, reusing, the, we're uh, connecting heat, collecting the heat to preheat the incoming liquid, right? So we're utilizing all of the energy that's available. That's on the evaporator side. Uh, as I mentioned before, right, you need an evaporator and a condenser. And then, so th simply what we do with our condenser, right, when you think about condensation, right, if you have ever had cold beverages in a hot summer, you notice that when you take them out of the fridge, right, because the surface of the beverage will have formed droplets. That is because 
water vapor in air, when it contacts a cold surface, it'll condense, forming droplets. And these may be the picture that you're seeing. Right? So these on the left is that the water basically condensed can either form droplets. These are called dropwise condensation. And the picture on the right shows you another kind of scenario where, where the droplets basically will just, you know, they will uh, accumulate and form a film of water which then, you know, shed due to gravity. So these are called dropwise and filmwise condensation. So these are typical when people think about condensation, these are the modes that, you know, you will think of, these are the pictures, right? And, and so these are, you know, videos showing condensation in action, si uh, cross-sectional views of droplets and versus the liquid film. And so these are nice, right? Can we do better? Can we do, uh, you know, uh, better at condensation? at condensing those water vapors, right? So what we, you know, we go back to literature and the idea is, you know, when you phase changing, right? When you change a phase from vapor to liquid, how can you maximize heat transfer? That's, you know, what we do, like engineers, we think about how do we enhance heat transfer? And it turns out, right, people found that when you have a liquid film evaporating, when the film thickness is really thin, around, you know, one micron, really thin, right? You know, the thickness of my hair is about 100 micron. So one over hundredth of the thickness of my hair. <laughs> when the thickness is about one, one micron, that's when the evaporation flux is the highest, right? So in, in, in this image, you see a peak, right? That peak is corresponding to a thin film with, uh, you know, thickness about one micron. And that is true for condensation as well, right? When you, when you have a thin, liquid with a film thickness of, of about one micron, the condensation heat transfer is most efficient. And so we were inspired by this, right? So can we engineer something uh, that is really thin, that gives you a really thin film, right, when you're condensing? And we don't want any droplets to form. We don't definitely don't want any thick liquid film to form. We just want one micron thickness of uh, fi films. And it turns out, right, we can use, uh, we can engineer a structure that promotes thin film condensation, right? Condensation will occur only on a region where the film thickness is around one micron or a few microns. So the way we do it is we're inspired by all the nano engineering where you can engineer surfaces with, you know, precise control of the surface roughness and surface geometry. So here's what we proposed, right? So we, we, we propose that you can, you, you can simply put a membrane on top of a metal surface. So that's the condenser, right? And this membrane, guess what it is, right? It's nothing fancy. It is just a tissue paper <laughs> that you can get, right, from clinics. These are tissue paper. These are naturally, you know, it has a lot of fibers. And it's na also naturally very hydrophilic, meaning hydrophilic, meaning that water likes that material. Right? And so we put a hydrophilic tissue paper on top of a metal support. And con water vapor condenses on the tissue paper, on the, on the micropore, within the pores of the tissue paper. And then the water basically directly enters the backside of it, right? And then it dr drips down due to gravity. So this is, this is the device. And the, a nice thing about our device is that we, we again have a lot of, you know, thin film. The thin film in here is, you know, if you look at the zooming view of a pore, one of the pore, right? You have solid, that's the tissue paper. You have liquid, that's the condensate. And then you have vapor, right? When the three phases meet, you have a very thin liquid film that's highlighted in the uh, black box, right? So we have a lot of thin film area on the surface that gives us really good condensation heat transfer. So I really, I don't want to bore you with this, but the bottom line is that we engineered a full system considering an evaporator, basically, we have wa water running through the evaporator constantly, which rejects salts. And we also had a condenser, right, right beneath the evaporator with very efficient condensation, right, much better performance compared to drop-wise and film-wise condensation. The other nice thing is that these two membranes are very close to each other. You can put them very, very close to each other, as close to each other as possible, such that vapor only needs to travel a very short distance before it travels from the evaporator membrane to the condenser membrane, right? So we minimize the, uh, the vapor transport resistance. 
and it's a full system, right? We have both evaporation and condensation. So that's uh, you know how the design, the how the concept works. So I'm now trying to show you how the device lo look like, right? So we engineered this device. You can see in the on the top left, that's the uh, concept. On the top right, that is a you know 3D view of our actual device that we built. And on the bottom surface, it shows the top-down view of the evaporator membrane. And it is black because we want the membrane to absorb sunlight. So it's a black material that it absorbs all the light right, coming to the membrane. And the, uh, the middle uh, picture is also a, you know, the top evaporator membrane. And the membrane on the bottom right, that's the condenser. So you know, I, you know, that's the tissue paper that we used. It's basically just uh, on an aluminum support. So that's the system. And we also, we care so much about efficiency, right? So you don't, you know, we have a system and we, we care about how much water can you produce and per unit square meter of sunlight, right? So we care about this efficiency and we define a solar to water efficiency as this, right? So how much water you're producing, that is what we care, right? So and that's the, that's the kilogram, that's the weight of the water that's being produced. Divi uh, mul multiply by the latent heat. So that's the energy that must be cost to produce one kilogram of water. And the denominator is just sunlight, right? The sunlight times the, m the area of the device. So that's the efficiency. And so, so first of all, right, we uh, let's think about what material we want to use for the evaporator, right? We want a hydrophobic material because Right, we want water to stay on top of that membrane. So if we have a hydrophilic material, water will just go through the material. Right? So we need something that repel water. So the membrane needs to be hydrophobic. It needs to absorb sunlight. It also needs to be microporous, such that you have a lot of pores for the evaporation to occur, and then water vapor goes through the pore. So that's on the evaporator side. And we also want to keep in mind that, you know, uh, we need low-cost materials, scalable materials, right? So we turn to, like, you know, see what's available on the market. It turns out these kind of carbon paper, right? These are, you know, um, carbon microfiber paper. They are used commercially available in fuel cells, and they're used for, you know, separating a gas phase with a uh, liquid phase. So we just bought them, right? They're, uh, again, they're very cheap, and they're, you know, grayish, right, not e ideally black. So we coated this paper with carbon, right? So they're making them more black. So absorb sunlight really well, and then we're able to maintain its, uh, you know, porosity geometry. So that's the evaporator. And you can see that on the left, right, that's the absorptance, right? That's how much sunlight we're absorbing. You can see about 95% about between 90% 90, 90 to 95%, right? We're absorbing most of the sunlight as, and we're turning sunlight into heat. And then on the right, we test it, right? If you have just the evaporator under the sunlight and you're running water, salt water into the device, how much fresh water vapor can you get, right? We have an efficiency about 50%, uh, 49.1%. And again, on the figure you have mass, that's the mass of the water vapor that you, that's, that's leaving the system and over a period of uh, 10 hours, right? And, you know, this line is pretty linear, so we are very happy. This is very linear, right? It works for 10 hours. How about one week, <laughs> right? Then we look at, you know, what, is do you, what do you have for the condenser, right? As I mentioned to you before, we want to have film, thin film condensation, right? We want to have a lot of three-phase contact. And so this is a hydrophilic tissue paper microporous, right? So, and then we want to put it on a thermally conductive substrate, which is aluminum. It's also cheap, right? And the, the aluminum conducts heat away and then dissipate the heat to the environment. So this is what the device looks like, right? We have a tissue paper. Again, if you bring the tissue paper to a microscope, you see a lot of fibers, right? This fiber gives you a lot of surface area for evaporation. And then, you know, it's on top of a substrate. It's a metal support. It's a nickel-based uh, you know, mesh with a lot of area for the water to flow laterally and going out at an outlet. Um, 
I want to show you this, right? This is really quickly. And so this is the condenser, again, with no droplet, right? Because condensation occur within the membrane. And so that's why you can f bring the membrane, condensation membrane, very close to the evaporator membrane, right? I w also want to show you this video, right? Because now we do not have any droplets. And if you produce one unit of water into the system, you get one unit of water out. Right. Again, no, nothing gets stuck in the system, right? Because all the condensate basically, when they form on the front side of the membrane, they got they enter the back side of the membrane immediately, and so you can collect all of the water with no issue of flooding. And so here is the uh, setup, right? We're you know we did ten hour setup, uh, an experiment. We we're curious to see can we do this for longer for days and even weeks. So we did an experiment in the lab again. So we have a solar simulator. Basically, it's a xenon lamp that is producing light, very, very similar to sunlight, natural sunlight. But the solar simulator, we can keep it on you know, constantly, right? So this is our device. And again, we want to run this passively. So we had a bucket of water <laughs> using s water from Galita Beach, right? And it's funny, my student had to carry this bucket of water from the, from the beach and then, you know, carry the water into our lab. And we have the water in the bucket and it just flows into our device. And we turn on the lamp, right, and the desalinated, refreshed water simply drips down from the bottom of the device and we have like a white uh, beaker uh, collecting all the w fresh water. So that's the beaker you're seeing. And we're just putting that beaker on a mass scale to measure how much mass we're collecting over the, the duration of seven days. So here's the result, right? If you look at the top left uh, figure, that is the mass of water we're collecting uh, over seven days. Right? So it's, very again, very linear. We're very happy about it because it suggests that there is no salt precipitation in our system. Because if you have any fouling issue with your membrane, then the, the efficiency will go down and you're, you will get uh, less water, right? So the curve would not be a linear curve. It'll kind of decay and curve and flattens. So we're really happy about this result. Again, this is using only passive way, right? And we get an efficiency about 32.9%. Still, we're quite happy about this because even though, right, compared to the state of the art literature, our efficiency is low. But I want to remind you that, you know, these work in, you know, that's already demonstrated, they cannot be run continuously. They can at most run up to 12 hours. And then you, at that point, you have to shut down the device and then clear the salt from your device. So, so that's a really, you know, unpractical uh, for, you know, real world applications, right? In real, real world applications, you want something that can not just running for 12 hours, you want it to run for 12 days or even 12, 12 months, right? A year. So we're really happy about this and we think that this can continue uh, much longer. We also did a syringe pump test, right? So this is similar result, right? 30, about 32% except that this time we're using a pumping, active pumping. So, uh, you know, I think uh, I'm trying to wrap up, but, you know, uh, just uh, last I want to share with you, right, we think that we, we know exactly how do we improve the efficiency. <laughs> so we built a heat and mass transport model. Again, I don't want to go through the model. I don't want to show the equation to bore you guys. But the key take-home message is that we think that we can get to 80% of efficiency by optimizing the heat and mass transport uh, in our system. And our model is also validated with our experiments, right? In the experiment condition, it matches pretty well with our, mo uh, with our experiment. So we, ha we think we, have we know exactly how do we enhance the efficiency to 80%. And now we're doing, you know, scaling this device up, we're doing, uh, you know, um, outdoor tests, right? Uh, you can see my students maybe on the roof of uh, inside a UCSD campus and uh, trying to measure the desalination performance during a hot summer day. And we're also thinking about, you know, uh, trying to play with the parameters, right? How can we maximize the heat transfer to further enhance the efficiency? And also thinking about, can you have multi-stage, meaning that you, you're reusing heat from the first stage to drive another uh, desalination device. 
So with that, right, I think I would like to conclude my talk and really thank you know, all of the students, you guys, right, my, the students that I work with, they built all the devices, they built all the membranes, tested the, all the membranes. We're actually engaging uh, undergraduate students in capstone design uh, projects, trying to engineer solar thermal desalination devices and actually conduct the, the experiment in our lab. So um, my students in my group, and also um, uh, uh, you know, funding sources, NSF and uh, IEE Institute for Energy Efficiency that funded this work. So with that, I really want to thank you for your attention and uh, like to take any questions you may have. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>